I feel like I experienced some extremes. I was in New York City last week for work. Um, and by the time I got done there, I came right back to Minnesota to take a quick breather up by uh, the lakes area up in Brainerd. It's something to get that city mouse, country mouse sort of experience. Do you? All do, inside do, of 12 hours. Do, do you feel, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you feel refreshed or replenished by going out and seeing some water and breathing some fresh air? Is there something to the country mouse side of, of things for you? There is. And also just looking at something different, period, is always good. But keep in mind that I only had a couple days in between my trip in Omaha and this trip. And so I feel like I'm still kind of dislocated right now. Yeah. I, yeah. Don't, I don't know where I'm where I'm really at. Well, thank goodness for home and for the hometown institutions like the Schubert Club, who are supporting Triloquy. Since 1882, Schubert Club has been cultivating a passion for music and fosters an engaged community of music enthusiasts through concerts, music education, museum exhibits, and student scholarships. Learn more at schubert.org. I'm going to speak a little bit more to some of the things Schubert Club has coming up uh, in the announcements section. But as we're getting started here, you know, we're talking about City Mouse country mouse sort of experiences, being in different places. And there's a lot of music that really paints the picture of a place. In the second movement today, I'm going to bring in a New York themed, a New York inspired piece of music that I've been spending some time with. But in the just general idea of music that speaks to geography, are there any songs or compositions or orchestral works that come to mind for you there's one that comes to mind outs? yeah right away and it it goes all the way back to the old bugs bunny cartoons anytime that there was a scene taking place underwater mm -hmm. this music was with it uh the hebrides overture by mendelssohn also known as fingal's cave which is the name of the cave on this little archipelago island mm -hmm. off the coast of of scotland where the seas are tumultuous and and the rocks are slippery and octagonal shaped and yeah. it's really a really a scene it doesn't really start tumultuous if we listen to the opening of the piece of music here what are you envisioning or what sort of context can you provide for folks when it comes to this i don't know mysterious opening that's the first word that comes to mind for me what about for you uh this feels like an approach this is definitely approach music you know maybe um coming up to the island and just poking right here above the surface of the waves a bit getting a shot of the uh the cave in the distance Is it your general affinity for things Irish and English that attract you to this piece of music, or is is there something more? Why is why is uh, Mendelssohn's Hebrides? It looks like Hebrides for folks who <laughs> Hebrides, don't know this yeah. <laughs> piece of music, but the the Hebrides. Like yeah. why why is this something that you're just so attracted to? It's the strangest thing. It never happened to me until I looked at a picture online of mm. Fingal's cave, and they even have you know you can if if it's calm you can walk back in there. Yeah, you know when the when the ship drop when the boat drops you off, and it just good. I just get this hinky feeling about me. Yeah, that I don't know if maybe in a previous life I've been there. Maybe I don't know. Um, it's likely actually considering your affinity toward all of all of those sorts of things. But I think it's interesting when you say a picture uh, gave you the context to really give you another level of appreciation for that piece of music. I think and there's now something the music to does that. It. Yeah. 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 There's something to that. You know, that that's what I'm thinking about with uh, New York. I'm not going to bring in empire state of mind in the second movement, but I did want to share a little bit of this uh, piano arrangement of it by Benedict Waldauer. It, you know, in the same way that uh, Fingal's cave, the uh, Hebrides overture just reminds you or makes you think or, or takes you to a place. Um, New York themed music, does that for me too. And I think this piano arrangement of Empire State of Mind is a really great example of how we can bridge today's sort of sensibilities and experiences into something that can be performed on a classical stage or on classical radio.
just something about that melody, you know, and I think it's really beautifully realized on piano there. But I know that, you know, we all have different opinions about New York City and what, <laughs> what our engagement of it would be. It doesn't sound like a place that you're too much in a hurry to get to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, but, you know, you often talk about um times in in your life or pieces of music being filled with so much possibility just nothing but possibility sure and as much of a fucking headache excuse my french that getting into new york is and leaving new york is i'll tell you i spent close to four hundred dollars just on getting to and fro right you know when it comes to lifts uh ubers from the airport and x y and z so there is definitely that challenge but at the same time when i walk down those sidewalks and i maybe try to get out of my own body and, and my own ego or whatever and just see myself as one of the millions of ants, you know, walking around this city. Mm -hmm. I think about my mission and I think about what I'm there to do and and the values that I hold and the vision that I have for the future. And there must be so much more of that. And when I think about New York City in that context, and when I think about the New York City adjacent music in that context, it's just, it's, it's inspiring to me. It, it, it juices me up. So, you know, maybe there is something that can be taken from the more rural, you know, off the beaten path, Hebridean style experience and sensibility, as well as the, the city experience. If you have the opportunity to get on that rocky boat. And because somewhere where I'm not going, mm -hmm. but you know, or, or maybe I don't know, maybe I can be talked into. First it, off, they you know they don't just <laughs> take you up there and dump you off no matter what. Right. Everything has to be calm, exactly, in, know, in order yeah. for you to get. <laughs> but but, there, but there, so but so so what are the you know experiences or feelings that you feel like you could pull from physically being in this place that uh, has through music given you so much context or so much imagery so much you mean to actually to actually be there and experience it what i would bring home from it sure um I, it would be something right along the lines of what mendelssohn thought i'm writing this to give you an idea of what came to mind mm -hmm. when i saw this place and i can only imagine what it would be like right now it would it would be nerve-wracking getting up there because like you i'm not nutty about being out like a a, a cork Right, <laughs> in all these oceans, you know, <laughs> converging together. Uh huh. Yeah. But it's always, you know, uh, getting there is part of the story. And, so that has to be part of. And it. Mendelssohn was not Irish or English. He wasn't from right. that part of the world, but he took his skills and you know the platform he had to shine a light on a different culture or yeah. or a different experience. I feel like music does that. The more music that we uncover, the more music that we center that hasn't been centered, and the more music that we celebrate, the more of the world we get to see, you know, in the same way that Mendelssohn saw it as his responsibility to shine a light on this and create musical experiences that you speak to now. I feel like there had to have been a little bit of that when Jay-Z and Alicia Keys sat down to put together Empire State of Mind and the piece of music that I'm bringing in uh, for the, the second movement today. Mm -hmm. There's just more that we have the ability to see and experience through this music. We just have to take the opportunity to actually platform some of it. There are a lot of stories and uh, and perspectives that we, through Western classical music, have become very familiar with, things that you know we know about history. There are even more things that we don't know about history. And you know, not to compare ourselves to Hove or Alicia Keys or Mendelssohn, but I feel like we're doing something very similar here. We're helping more people see more of the world, experience more of the world as they can through music. That's Isn't my that hope. a beautiful thing? I can't imagine a more wonderful thing. Certainly more wonderful than being in a rocky boat near the Hebrides, <laughs> Hebridean Sea, you know, yeah. bobbing down into an underwater cave. Yeah. Or, like, like I said, that is an experience that I probably won't have physically. So thank goodness for the music to bring me there because otherwise we can fly the drone up under there, but I'm not <laughs> right. Going. So just next time, Pull up a picture of it, listen to the music, and go. Yeah, I got, I got the idea. I got, I got I'll, a vibe. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. If you figure out a way for us to get to the Hebrides, I will suck it up, put on my life jacket, and get on that boat. But the connecting flight over there across the Atlantic has to be in New York, and we have to have a couple of New York days. Is 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 that a deal? Can we, can can we see? You're you're looking hesitant. 
If <laughs> if we can get that money together, you got it, baby. Yeah, no, it's win. You know, oh, I I can I can do it. If you're if you're mm-hmm. if you're ready to take on the challenge, and see, and that's the other part of Triloquy. You know, taking perspectives and experiences and putting ourselves into them, even though it may be challenging or or uncomfortable. But there's a lot to learn there. You know, who knows? Maybe you could even yes, you know, I would go. Find, sure. find find your favorite pizza spot I can show you know not Sabaro's Sparrow. pizza like like Michael Scott you know on on the office anyway hello everyone this is Triloquy we're bringing worlds together and trying to help y'all see a little bit more of these worlds we bring together let's go ahead and jump in I'm Garrett McQueen. I'm Scott Blankenship. And this is Triloquy, Opus 167. Thank you to all of the returning listeners who have made this show possible week after week after week, all the way here into year four. If this is your first time checking out the Triloquy podcast, Triloquy is a show that takes the idea of classical music and approximates it to pieces of music, to conversations, to ideas, and everything in between that haven't always been associated with that phrase classical music, but things that we throw into that bowl to the larger goal of decolonizing classical music, making classical music something that relates to more people, that connects more worlds as we were just talking about and hopefully is a way for all of this thing and all of its peripheral institutions like opera houses, concert halls, classical radio stations, their means of survival in the future in an ever-changing world, society, and way of thinking about music. For more information on the Triloquy podcast, you can uh, visit triloquy.org, T-R-I-L-L-O-Q-U-Y dot O-R-G. You can check out past opuses there. You can donate to the Triloquy podcast, and you can learn a little bit about some of the folks who make this thing possible. In addition to your very generous support, support for Triloquy comes from Springboard for the Arts. More on them at springboardforthearts.org. Also, a special shout out and thank you for their support to Schubert Club. Schubert club has some very interesting things coming up you know scott speaking of worlds coming together on october 9th we have a performance by uh, the academy of saint martin in the fields uh here in saint paul sponsored by schubert club there is a courtroom concert coming up by julia and arena elkina they are a piano duo and something that i am particularly excited about it's a kids jam celebrate haitian cultural heritage with afutai that will be on tuesday october 25th If you're in Minnesota or in the Twin Cities area, be sure to put that on your calendars. Uh, The description here says, listen to the vibrant rhythms of Haitian music and learn about their culture and traditions through dance, percussion, song, and storytelling. Create your own folk instrument and play along with this energetic ensemble. We're talking about going to the Hebrides through music. Mm -hmm. I've never been to Haiti. I don't think you've ever been to Haiti, but what a great experience to go there, at least musically, through this collaboration and through this uh, initiative and project that Schubert Club has put on. So you can learn about this and all of the upcoming events at Schubert.org. I just want to give a quick shout out, too, because not only does uh, that include a kids program, which is awesome, Mm -hmm. but I'm loving some of these start times for 7.30. 7.30. Yeah, before it gets too late because I got to get home. See? I got I got weed to smoke. I got, you know, I got some memes on YouTube to watch. So let's go ahead and get the concert <laughs> so that we can go home and get ourselves settled. You know, that's a ver- version of equity. Just some very, <laughs> very responsible start times, all I'm Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Shout out to everyone over there at Schubert Club. Shout out to each and every one of you for your continued support. Let's jump into movement one. All right. Well, uh, speaking of worlds coming together, exploring different things, we're going to begin this week with, I don't know, I'm going to give this a sharp. I'm going to go ahead and give give this a sharp. We're going to go up to Canada, specifically to the city of Toronto. I'm reading here from thestar.com headline, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra's new CEO has a plan to bring classical music to the masses. All right. We've heard that one before, right? So (laughs) just, just, you know, 
keeping along the pattern of our headline check, when you see someone else talking about bringing classical music to the masses, Mm -hmm. after all of your work in radio, after all of your work here on Triloquy, what comes to your mind first? Attaboy. Good luck. Oh, do you know what you're getting yourself into? What sort of feelings come with that? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, do you know what you're doing? Do you really know what you're doing? Um, My question to you is, do you think that he has a shot? I think he does have a shot. And uh, we'll look at a little bit of this article to learn why. Uh, This uh, article is about a man named Mark Williams. It says here, looking back on his school band days in Ohio, when he shifted from the horn to the clarinet, Williams uh, went on to elaborate, quote, it's such an incredibly difficult instrument. It can make people a bit neurotic. You need to learn control and you have to have a really good ear. I think they frame this article, this story around Mark Williams's shift from the horn to clarinet, Mm -hmm. because a lot of this is about his shift from being a performer focused musician over into the world of arts administration. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? There are a lot of conversations that happen on my side of it when it comes to arts administrators who have been performers or who have who have the chops to be performers, Mm -hmm. you know, really affirming our ability to do that if we want to. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I I think that conversation is neither here nor there, because if I want it to be on the audition circuit and and join one of these orchestras, I would be. And a lot of you bassoonists would be in trouble, you know, but that's a that's a that's a confidence that I come to arts administration and advocacy with that I have made the decision to go along this path. That's not the confidence that every musician has who sure. lands on the arts administration side. You've never been a, a performer-based musician, but in your trajectory as a radio host, I imagine there must be more behind-the-scenes jobs that you would take now that you may not have considered when you were beginning your career and aspiring to being this impactful on-air radio host. Or maybe considered and then realized everything that was in between you and that goal and went, okay, I think maybe I'll aim for this for a little bit. You mm-hmm. know, try to build your career. You know, you can you have your stepping stones sure. and whatnot. But um, did you have those stepping stones? I mean, I it did. seems like you just kind of jumped into the onto the microphone. Yeah, at KVNO, that's that's what an internship will get you mm. is mic time. Yeah, and over the course of fifteen years, I did everything except for the program director job. You know, just um, when a door opened, I happened to be standing there to walk through it. So I I saw a lot of different aspects of the station, and I really think that. Uh, sometime soon I should give up the spot on the microphone that I have mm-hmm. to a person of color or from the LGBTQ plus communities, any of those, uh, and to try to find something that I can be more beneficial behind the scenes, some project management maybe. What what do some of those behind the scenes things look like? Are you talking about writing for hosts or creating shows? What, what does that physically look yeah, like? Development, show development, incubation. Things like that, yeah, and that's that's a big part of the job of uh, arts administrators on the uh, you know on the back end of orchestras and um, and sure. operas, you, you know, just programming and and putting the pieces together. Think about it; you're trying to forecast what the taste is going to be for how many seasons in advance? Many? Do you plan many seasons? I mean, yes. ten, twenty. Really, I was sure. going to say five ish. That would be my guess. I mean, sure, but you know, you're you're always thinking about well, what are we going to do for the fiftieth anniversary of our organization, or you know, the, and who's those available? those milestones are always who's you know, available at, at the front, okay. yeah, yeah, and and who isn't. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll read a little bit more from this article. It says, "For Mark Williams, who arrived in Toronto earlier this year to become CEO of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, the first Black CEO of a major orchestra in North America, it seeded an interest that would only bloom with time." Quote, when you're making chamber music together and you look into someone else's eyes, there's nothing like that. It is that kind of communication. Beautiful. You know, and he's comparing, again, the performance side with the administrative side. We, we bring up Titus Underwood's name a lot when we read about someone being the first black person somewhere. To what, whatever. What, what do you remember from that conversation? What, what were some of, at, at least at that time, Titus's take away from the idea of censuring people being the first black yeah, something. That was a good conversation. That was you, David Norville was there, mm-hmm. and Lacoli in Washington. And um, Titus was basically talking about how he's ready for some boring stories. Yeah. You know, everyday stories <laughs> of black people, you know, rather than, well, this is the first one to do this, that, or the other. 
uh, and hanging everything on that. Yep. I mean, that's it's one thing to go. William Grant Still was the first to blah blah blah, and then you start talking about everything else. But to hang everything on that first, that's a different yeah. story that you ought yeah. not, you ought not to rely on. The danger that I think we get into when we start talking about the first this and the first that is that we're splitting hairs because it says here that Mark Williams is the first uh, black person to be the CEO of a major orchestra in North America. I'm thinking about Anwar Nazir. Shout out to Anwar Nazir, who is executive director of the Louisiana Philharmonic in New Orleans, where you just were not too long ago. So mm-hmm. are they saying that that's not a major symphony orchestra of North America? You know, we we have that. But the even the bigger danger that I think there is for folks to fall in, specifically the people of color, the folks being cited as the first X, Y, and Z, is that the arrival to a place is often celebrated when the work that happens after the arrival at a place should be celebrated. And this isn't anything against, you know, Mark Williams, but if you are named, you know, music director of NPR or general manager of classical or something, it's not that I wouldn't congratulate you for that, but, you know, knowing me, me knowing me, I would be waiting to see what tables you're turning over and what programming mm-hmm. decisions you make before the congratulations begin to roll out. That's I at least you my, would. That, that's, that's my way of thinking yep. about it. We're talking about a track record, aren't <laughs> right, we? we got to right. develop a track record. Mm-hmm. Um, I was more interested in a quote that I found a couple of paragraphs down when I asked, does he have a shot? Because he lists some things that sound like things that we've talked about before on past pods, but it doesn't say how these things will be achieved. Mm -hmm. So, for example, here's the quote. Williams uh, says he will be overseeing everything from operations to facilities, marketing, communications, and he says, I would like for the orchestra to be more visible. This city has just grown and grown and grown, and I would like to see the orchestra taking up more space, not just in its own arts and culture silo. So that Mm. sounds good, right? Getting out, right? Ultimately, we need to be Toronto's symphony orchestra, and what that means is whatever is important to the city has to be important to us, an open-hearted, doors-open orchestra. Now, how? How does that track record start? How does that ripple effect come out? Well, it's, he says here, what that means is whatever is important to the city has to be important to us. Right. So my question is, what's important to the city? Yes. You know, what, what, are, what are people caring about? What are people looking for? How would you answer that? And, you know, not to put you on the spot, but how would you answer that for the Twin Cities, or even Omaha. You know, what, what is important to these places where you have some experience? Is that something that you're able to, you know, express? That's something that I would have to take a minute to think about. I can name a few things. Sure. But- I mean, is it too obvious in the Twin Cities to be looking at uh, law enforcement issues after George Floyd? Is that too on the nose? Um, addressing the riots of, mm-hmm. you know, some places haven't fully recovered. Um, and yet there's other places that are um, back to normal-ish, thriving. Yeah. Um, for Omaha, I haven't been there enough to know. But even on the more positive, here in the Twin Cities, there are enough people, there are plenty of people who really, really care about Prince. It seems like he would have more of a center position in more of the programming decisions or, hmm. or, or what orchestras are doing. I mean, imagine if Beethoven had visited here once upon a time or or let's say instead of Dvorak going to Spillville he you know created a whole bunch of things and say I think he actually did come through St. Paul Yeah he visited something. like like an afternoon but, but if there was more of that history here I I imagine that the orchestras would be milking that dry you know mm-hmm. so it's not only the 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 not so positive things are important and definitely have a space you know a necessary space in in these uh in these arts fields at the well, same time you know it's not only that it, the, 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 it's it's a big job and a big responsibility for folks in positions like mark williams to really understand what it is that a that a city wants what it what does it mean for this ensemble to be toronto's symphony orchestra for us maybe indigenous issues you yeah. know and giving them the power to tell their stories from a positive perspective or an uplifting perspective would yeah. be good yeah the other thing that i think about when 
Mark Williams says here, you know, he wants this this to be Toronto's symphony orchestra with arts institutions. I think there's so much pressure to be world class or, you know, have uh, national reach and, and those sorts of things. And to that, we tend to forget the importance of that local aspect of the work. I feel like there's some comparisons that can be made even, you know, in your career, the difference between being that local radio host host versus being that nationally syndicated radio host. But at the same time, you know, I've grown to appreciate the local a little bit more than the national. You bet your ass. I mean, say more, say more to that. Um, You you are in that community in the moment and you can speak directly to those issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you're minding a national shop, if you start talking about an issue in one spot, it might not make sense to a station that is over here on the opposite side of the country. And then all of a sudden you have, you know, whole cities full of people who are feeling left out. Yeah. So, oh man, I used to, b- before I took this gig, I always preached the evils of networks. Mm-hmm. And uh, the problem is, is that there's a lot of folks in these local markets who can't make it on just that gig. Right, right. Now, you you did multiple gigs when you were at, UOT, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, most of the stuff was local. Some of the stuff did get some national reach. That That's how I'm here in, right. in, in the first place. Right. But there was something magical about knowing that you are a part of the culture of a place. And you bet. There, you know, there were times when it, I certainly wanted to go to a concert and not be, you know, bothered or sign an autograph or anything. You know, mm-hmm. I, you always remain grateful for that. Um, so, and I only mentioned that to say, you know, there, there is a cost to everything. So, yeah. so sometimes being that local person, you know, comes with this thing. I think about being a local news host, you know, local news more often than not is cringy to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. No shade to anyone out there in particular, but you know, the evening on camera news person is just going to have a place in the community, in the culture of, of a city that is very much that. And I think there's power in that. I, I want us to shift in the arts to we're thinking about local impact more than we think about just being a national name. And that's a challenge for a lot of performers, particularly, but even arts administrators, because like radio, we go where the work is. So sometimes yep. by the time we hop around so many cities, you know, we're looking at our watches or our calendars to learn to figure out, you know, where, where we are. But, you know, it's I think it's up to us to really dig in and try to have more of that local uh local impact you know right um have you i don't know what 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 do you think about digging in more locally from your work's perspective you you have a national audience to engage so it can't be too local to engage them but at the same time do you not think someone in mobile alabama or phoenix arizona might think it's cool to hear you say something about how snowy it is today in saint paul or or x y or z that is really locally focused you know there there could be something there i would think maybe i don't know i don't do that why not? i haven't i haven't done it for the last 16 years but why not well keep in mind that when before you worked at american public media there was not a whole lot of effort being put in to sounding like we weren't in that neighborhood wherever the station was playing so the uh, there 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 were loads of people down in Nashville who thought I was there. And that's what I'm saying. I feel like that's what arts institutions are fighting right now this idea that we need to be sort of timeless and geography less but at the cost of not really having that local engagement. Yeah, that's I, the issue. I, I, I think, you know, maybe even radio, national radio needs to shift in that direction as well, considering the novelty of giving someone who doesn't live in a place a perspective yeah, on that place. That's what, the conundrum. What, what, what were we not talking about that in the very opening? You know, I don't have to be from the UK to appreciate the Hebrides, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 neither do you because you love that piece of music and 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 all the things you talked about. I think that can translate into the way that we approach the local versus national conversations in our presentations of of this music. I think that can be created with the bravery to just do so that's always the tug of trying to find that that spot where it makes sense both regionally and nationally Mm -hmm. and and i don't think that i've hit it but a few times yeah 
Yeah. Well, before we leave this, you know, I have to go down to the comments because, you know, that's where the story oh, really comments. is. And uh, the top comment here, of course, the, uh, the the person doesn't name themselves. They 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 never do. But no. I'm just going to read here. Um, it says, it is painful to see what the Toronto Symphony Orchestra has become. In this year's season, there is a concert dedicated to Star Wars. Another to Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, others entitled Elf in Concert, The Music of Queen, Murdoch Mysteries, and Black Panther in Concert. That one really must have pissed them off. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes off to say a couple of decades ago, the TSO aspired to become a world leading symphonic ensemble. It now appears to be the orchestra um, is positioning itself instead as a third rate pops orchestras. Lovers of serious music in this city will have to look elsewhere. So this is the thing. We can talk about how ridiculous that is or how we shouldn't listen to that. But based on the conversation that we're having, aspiring to being that world class thing, just as they name here in this in this comment, takes Trump. It sounds like the radio stations and many of the arts institutions are siding with this sentiment instead of the more local, the more uh, engaging to more people approach to presenting this music. Mm. I have played some of the things that he mentions in this uh, comment on my show, and I know for a fact that the Toronto Symphony Orchestra has not gotten rid of any of the canon in favor of these things that he's listing. These are other right. these are other concerts, right? So I can't even take this account person seriously. You know, they're 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 point. Ah. But we take it we 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 take comments like that with a grain of salt until it's time to actually put our money where our mouth is I know, that's yes, what i'm saying yeah and i know where you're going with that one if we if we if we listen to the good comments we have to give as much credence to this one as well and that's why i don't i don't pay attention to either <laughs> that's why i don't i don't believe the good ones or the bad ones otherwise i would never sit in front of this mic with you okay well i believe all of them and i think there is something to that comment. I think there's some there's some conflation happening because being locally aligned and locally focused doesn't necessarily have much to do with a Star Wars concert or a Tim Burton concert. So those those two things are put in side by side, but again, at the end of the day, I think there are a lot of arts institutions, yours included, that have more of that national focus as opposed to local engagement and exploring how that could manifest positively, not only for the communities, but for the institutions themselves. I just hope that more institutions will consider what it looks like to put down the aspiration of being nationally known or known across the globe and really having that that local impact. That's mm. that's that's my thing. And that's some, and I'm not just throwing that at you. I'm I'm applying that to myself mm -hmm. as well. You know, uh, for for the Triloquy podcast, you know, we certainly aspire for it to be, you know, uh, a national conversation, even a global conversation. We're in 55 countries at the same time. We do have a responsibility to, you know, local conversations, local artists. You know, you bring a lot of you brought a lot of local artists here on the show, mm -hmm. you know, sharing sharing their music. So I, I think maybe at the end of the day, it's a balancing act. But I'm really attracted to the idea of turning the attention more local and exploring what it could look like to care more about our neighbors than what a national review has to say about what we're doing. Good point. Well, um. I think that'll do it for this one. I'll have it linked in the description for y'all to check out. You know, you are off mic. I asked you about your knowledge of the city of Toronto um, and what you would put on stage. You know, I don't I don't know a whole bunch of, about the city. You don't seem to know a whole bunch about the city, but I do mm -hmm. know that Drake is from Toronto. So if I were the CEO trying to form Toronto's symphony, Drake's music would just have to have a regular place in and what's being programmed and what's being delivered. So with that in mind, you know, under, under that inspiration, I found a, a violin cover by a Dr. Violin. That's the name of this account. Uh, he's playing here a violin arrangement of Tusi Slide by Drake. So nice. we'll listen to a little bit, a bit of this to get us to our next accidental.
Shout out to Dr. Violin. I mean, I would love to go into a concert hall and hear something like that. He's doing it. And if Mark Williams wants to make the Toronto Symphony Toronto Symphony, I think there has to be some consideration for that sort of aesthetic and those sorts of connections. Before we move on, I just want to make sure that you understood the point that I'm trying to make. When I ask you about those local connections and you talk about not attempting to make local connections after 16 years as a national radio host, you can't tell me that it's impossible to speak to St. Paul, even though you have the earshot of San Diego or Columbia, South Carolina. That is possible. Mm -hmm. It's not that you can't do that. Okay, but also, I was also thinking of it from the direction of how in the hell am I going to tell a local story about Buffalo when I've never set foot in the city? Sure, yeah, we're not, right. So we're not talking about trying to be local somewhere. We're talking about being local where you actually are. I think that's what what I'm talking about. Sure. And and like I said, over the last couple of years, that has changed. Mm-hmm. That facade has come down. Um, and, and I've done it where it makes sense. Yeah. Well, good. I'm very happy. That's where everybody needs to be Boy, moving that whole toward. Tug I of war over nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go on to your accidental. What you get? Well, what 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 accidental is this going to get? Uh, this one is going to get a sharp. And I'll read for you the title from the BostonGlobe.com. Shushed at the symphony. Is it time to clap back at no clapping rules? Our critic investigates the origin of applause and how other concert hall conventions came to be. Before we even go into the concert hall, what's your reaction to getting shushed? (laughs) Just on the streets or, you know, (laughs) anywhere. It's kind of like being booed. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Don't shush me. But we have normalized shushing each other in certain spaces with the orchestra concert and the opera house being the main one of them, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I remember we were in the studio uh, back in season one of Triloquy. Somebody was uh, mixing a live performance that we were doing. It wasn't Nirmala, but it was somebody. Mm -hmm. And and he he was shushing us, and I fell away. (laughs) I'm like, wait a minute, this is my project. You leave. But but (laughs) everyone Everyone's doing believe. their job. Everyone's doing their job. You know, yeah. shout out to Cam. Anyway, go on. Uh, more Talk to me more about this article here. Well, it, it covers things that we have talked about on the podcast many times, which is the conventions and norms that have been set up around um, certain event etiquette. Mm-hmm. And in this instance, orchestral event etiquette. So you're not, you're supposed to sit there and in, in odd reverence for the music. And not clap in between. That's where you can cough and switch off that one bad hip. Sure, right? sure. And then at the end, you can get your bravos in and stand there, right? So this is arguing that, well, you should be able to clap where you want to show appreciation. Mm-hmm. And it goes all the way back to the days of Mozart, who um, people who had money could afford to have an ensemble play music just for their dinner or for their Yahtzee game or whatever it is that Mm -hmm. they're doing. And Mozart wrote to his dad and he's like, these people are carved of wood. (laughs) No matter what I did, I'm up here, you know, sweating to try to give these people some entertainment. And they're just over there doing their, you know, whatever thing that they hired me to cover. Mozart said, you paraded me all across Europe as a child. I didn't even get to have a childhood and you send me over here and these people don't even care what I'm doing at the keyboard. <laughs> they round here drawing. They round here playing with the pets, you know, having dinner, cheersing, and they don't give a damn about the blood, sweat, and tears that have been put into what I'm offering. Help me. Help me, Dad. So you start to see the thread. <laughs> so right around this time and of Beethoven's time, uh, even uh, venues are starting to be constructed around these new higher ideas that the music had, right? You know, we're talking about literary uh, and and religious things and, mm-hmm. and uh, pastoral scenes and things like that. And we really needed to sit down and really just kind of take it in, yeah. you know, these bigger themes. And that is something that really stuck. And I'm finding this quote down here near the bottom. Uh, here it is. Um, there was a so-called Verk Troya ideal, as philosopher Lydia Gore has argued, it helped to transform concert halls into rarefied environments apart from the world, akin to museums where one might stare at a great piece of art through the glass that, when conditions were ideal, was transparent. She goes down here, uh, down a little bit further. Yet, from the beginning, the trend toward reverential listening, there have been skeptics. What will result from this scrupulous silence and continuous attention? 
He answered the question with a prediction: fewer people will enjoy themselves. So not so not only did you know this time directly after Mozart give us sit down, shut up, <laughs> and enjoy this, and whether you like it or not. It and also let this happened to you. It, it also codified. The way we program, even today, it sounds like. Correct. She starts talking about noticing how even back in Mozart and Beethoven's time, instead of playing, you know, all the hits of the people who were alive and working, it all of a sudden began to be more about this growing canon mm -hmm. of the composer's past. So even in Mozart and Beethoven's time, they were saying, hey, how come we're focusing on this Handel character when, you know, I just wrote this great whatever. And, you know, they had to write a subscription series, right? So they, yeah. they you know, people were waiting for them to crank out new material. And I, I, I appreciate uh, out of this. So there's a, a Boston University professor that's named James Johnson. It says here, Johnson, the Boston University professor, wisely notes that from the outset, there was something exclusionary in the new silence of the early 19th century. Bourgeois con codes of conduct emphasize politeness as a key to a cultivated sensibility. And by insisting on others conforming to this code of etiquette, one reinforced one's own high standing, quote, policing manners, thus became an act of self-reassurance. It confirmed one's social identity. One half of the hall acted as police, so to speak, and demanded silence. That is so important to understand because when we're talking about the late 19th century, this, this tradition had been well documented and codified over in England by the time the practice came over here to the United States. That culture came with it. So we never right. had a chance here in the United States to actually a, enjoy these concerts. <laughs> right. I thought that was a great point that by the time it hit over here, that was already well it's well in place. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm so how do we fix this if we're if we're talking about shifting this bit of the culture to be more inclusive and more welcoming to more people, you know, we have to get this status and respectability and, and all, you know, decorum, all of those things out of the space. So it's our job to inspire change by doing what? I mean, going going into the concert hall with a bullhorn every time we hear something we love from the <laughs> from the principal violin. I mean, I'm down, but I, I feel like they'll <laughs> confiscate it before they let me in. But I mean, what what is it our job to do from your perspective toward changing this culture. See, it seems like we have to be the living example of what we want to see. How many people do you think you would need to bring with you to actually get those around you to start clapping in between movements? Like if you get enough people going, oh, well, that, I guess we're doing that now. If you can, if you can inspire a section to do it, do you think the rest of them are going to go, oh, I, you know, okay, that was good. You you remind me of you know. Th there's so many bits of connectivity, like in the same way that you know uh, a section in an orchestra. You know, during a really quiet section, you know, it takes that first person to decide to come in. You know, it takes the first string player to put their bow on the string. Damn it! <laughs> For everyone Shade. else to come in, you know, I think it's the same way from the audience perspective. I don't mind beginning the applause. So maybe I will uh, pledge to begin the applause between movements when I'm in, in concert halls, if I liked it. Because first of all, we're not going to normalize uh, uh, applauding everything that comes from the stage because not everything is engaging. And I think that's right. an important part of the conversation, you know, that we have to engage when we talk about framing the, the the programming to actually inspire legitimate reactions was it last week we were talking about um the jazz musician who passed away ramsey lewis mm -hmm. you know how he was talking about how we would just play the song and they would get up and start dancing yep. well it's you know so it has a it has to be something that we want to react to but b once we have what we want to react to we have to have the courage you know and i'm sp speaking of myself as well to actually begin that applause and get somebody else in the in the uh, crowd clapping with this so yeah okay now we're we're opening we're opening an interesting clam here though. okay are we only saying you should react if you think it's good yes yes are that's you, what i'm saying so no booze no jeers well <laughs> i don't know it, you're not going to sit in the back and go heard it <laughs> is there well so two things a 
if we're talking about diversifying concert spaces, that means we're talking about diversifying reaction to music. So I think that should be fair game. That's on you the know? table. And that and that puts some responsibility and some pressure on the folks who are on the stage to make sure that they're actually mm. doing something that's worth a damn. Mm. But B, would that not just loosen up the spirit of the room? A would boom? you not would you not lower your shoulders or, or would that would that make you tighter? Would, would that make you even more nervous? I don't know. If someone booed me? If you were in a concert space and you heard some jeering from somewhere. You're in the audience. Uh, I'm not while they're up there. Not what? while they're not, I, 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 I What? Just, I don't. I mean, what? A, a, a gymnast? Are you going to jeer a gymnast as they go up to the to the balance beam? <sighs> Yeah, I mean you're you're making. A are, good we gonna, point. are we going to turn this into a, a baseball game where you chant things about the people who come up to bat? Well, what's wrong if we do? Let let let's because let's be not, hyper, let's be a, hyperbolic and say yes, we're turning the concert hall into a baseball game. What's it, so so who's who's going to die? It's not a if someone now. boos somebody. You know who's going to actually get hurt? Would it would it if, would it impact your enjoyment of the piece? What if it was a composer and some music you were enjoying? And it starts getting cheers. Would it interfere with your enjoyment? Well, I mean, if if, if I want to hear something in silence without any crowd reaction, that means I need to take my ass home and listen to the kajillion recordings that already exist of this music that I'm probably hearing. No, no, on no. Stage. I said it's a composer that you like, <laughs> and it was music that you were enjoying. Sure. If it's music I'm enjoying, a composer I like, contemporary enough to not have recordings out there, and someone is booing and jeering, I think that's a part of the renewed experience that I have to accept. I mean, I can't have my cake and eat it too. If I want the concert hall to be transformed, that means I might hear a boo or a jeer every now and again. And personally, and for the sake of consistency, I have to say that I would have to be okay with that. Mm. But you would Very say, good. but you would say, get him out of here. You, you <laughs> that that was that that is what you think should happen to that person. It sounds like I would not jeer. How about that? Because I know that they're up there under pressure and trying to do a job. Okay, but you tell me. You ask me the question. Okay, so what's going to be my reaction when someone is jeering and I'm trying to sit there and enjoy the piece of music that oh, they played? So yeah. what's yours then? Right. So are, so, are we so gonna, the, is the, it the usher, the ushers need to go find them during intermission <laughs> and take them out. Is it the battle of the shushes? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> We're going to have a cold shush war. <laughs> right. You shush right. me. I'm going to shush you right back. No, but but no. You you tell me. You put me <laughs> on the spot. So what are you going to do if you're enjoying something in the concert hall and in this renewed space, someone is booing and jeering, and maybe even that builds up and turns. To, to something hmm. that's that's a that's what a renewed space is like right we don't really have that so much now it ha it does happen now you know sure. like the met gets booze every now and again and it really? makes it over the broadcast really even. I've, I've heard it on the radio but you know huh. uh, uh again though i'm, I'm not going to let you skirt the the question what do you do when your favorite composer is being played and someone is booing do you think they need to leave is, is that is that what is that what it is hmm yeah, yeah. If you don't like <laughs> you it, think leave. They need to leave. <laughs> if you don't like it, leave. <laughs> well, you heard it from Scott, <laughs> and that's well, why they're going to be out there going do better. But that's why we are where we are in the concert hall space right now because there are so many people with that attitude. Well, if you don't like it, just don't fucking come in here. Then what happens? What happens when they start playing something that you don't like? Well, then maybe I'm a boo as well. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because when we were at Sphinx and a certain piece came up, we ejected. Yeah, we left, didn't we? Okay, so you're, so you're, but that was out of, you know, politeness and and decorum. So I don't know. Maybe maybe we need to continue to have this conversation because mm. if we're going to normalize a renewal of the space, if we're going to take away the policing of other people's experiences. <sighs> I don't know. It's like I'm thinking about a rock concert. If I if I can't hear every word being said because everyone around me is cheering and, and throwing up their rock on hand signals and stuff, is am I not in the wrong place? If if I want to, you know, enjoy that music in silence, that means I'm in the wrong place at that point. So if we're gonna transform the concert hall to be more like that, I think. We need to allow some of it. And when was the last concert you were at where you could not hear the music because of the people around you? I um, mean, you just went to okay, Ramstein. Okay, okay, all right. So you're so it sounds like you agree that we just need to sh shut our fucking mouth in the concert hall. That that's what you're saying. <laughs> that's what you're arguing. That that is what you're arguing. Um, I don't think that clapping in between movements or when something uh, you see when when something is pleasing, uh, I think that's great. 
But if you are upset to the point where you are actively booing one right after the other, just get up and go. What if you what if you write a piece of music? Let, let, let's go let, let's go more nuanced than I like it, I don't like it. What if you're hearing a piece of contemporary music in the concert hall? And you know somehow that composer, you know, heard the uh, the let's say the Bial from Triloquy, you know, that you played on a guitar, and that is like a motif that's the basis of a fugue or something. And this new piece of music, you know, this person is a Triloquy listener. Are you not going to be in there? You know, hollering. Are you not going to be in there hollering? Are having some sort of reaction? There is. There is a circumstance under which you would vocalize in the concert hall. That's all I'm saying. Don't act like there is nothing <laughs> that is going to just press you in any sort of way. If I heard that, I probably I would be like Will Smith. <laughs> hey, that's mine. I mean, let, let's let's go back to your days uh, as a um, as an actor on the theater stage. Is your expectation for people to just sit there completely silently until the curtain call when y'all are bowing? Is that is that the experience you want? from 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 an audience well if i'm if if it has come to a point where there is silence out there that means i'm doing my job and they're paying attention and i've got them right in the palm of my hand or That's they're asleep means. or or it could be that not when i'm on stage so okay I'm all right all right all right well uh, anything else from this article because we could we, mm. we can unpack a lot i I, for, for, I guess for me the thing is we're so quick to jump to the side of the tradition when we consider what the renewal of the space could be. When we imagine someone booing and, and jeering, we don't center the fact that this person is naturally reacting to you know what their experience. We're centering the the people with furs and and pearls who mm -hmm. want complete silence. That's how I feel mm -hmm. when 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 the conversation goes down that that angle. Um, I see where you're coming from. I'm thinking of booze hindering an enjoyable experience for me. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we hey, just need to remain quiet. We we need to not hinder anyone's that's experience. That's not then, what huh? I said. Okay. That's well then, clear. Well then, well then, offer some clarity then. <laughs> All I'm saying is that if you feel the need to boo repeatedly, <laughs> then get up and out. You're not enjoying it. And there's some people around you that are. And then we'll have another hundred years of the concert hall looking the way it does because, you know, mm. because everyone just needs to get out mm. is, is, is what you're saying. <laughs> if you can get him to go there and sit in the first place. Since got the emails, y'all, because I say a boo. He t he's, the, he's the one who told y'all to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Scott told y'all to get the fuck out and 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 carry your I, scally wagon asses somewhere else. That is those, exactly what he said. None verbatim. of those things were said <laughs> throughout the course of this recording session. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll have that um, linked here in the description. Like I said on Twitter, you know, one of my tweets that hit off, uh, I think, is it might be my pen tweet. Now, if you're going to a concert this week, clap in between movements. Damn, yeah, no one is going to be harmed. Like, especially if it's Mendelssohn and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you never did say how many people around you would get the would get the the applause going, though. Okay, well then maybe it's just me then, and that's fine. I'm 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 okay standing alone then, right or on. sitting sitting alone, especially if I enjoyed it. If it's a black woman on stage and she just bodied right. the first movement of the Beethoven uh, violin concerto, yes, I am I am giving all of my applause to that. I am not going to boo an orchestra. If you want to boo them, go right ahead. I'm not going to do it, but I would like to. I would love to clap at a point where I thought, "Wow, that was awesome." You're not going, so you wouldn't have booed in Aspen when those uh, Nazi flags came. I told you. Down. I told you. I would not have out. been in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's return. Let's. I don't want to spend too much time, but I want to. Too late. I want to return to this maybe next week. Because there has to be some gray in between the black and white of sit there and be quiet and enjoy the show and leave if you're not enjoying the show. Because that's how we are where we are, except we don't even get to the people need to leave part of the equation because they aren't there in the first place. Mm -hmm. they, aren't, they aren't there to leave mm -hmm. because they know they won't enjoy it. And then we have nerve in the next breath to talk about diversifying things and making sure it survives when we actually don't care about the perspectives of the people who might boo. We have see, talked about we, that too. See, we, we care more about the perspectives of those who are silent and respectable right. than those who actually want to offer some sort of reaction. I just don't feel that way. 
I, I feel like we need to center the people who actually have some reaction, have some reaction that we aren't used to in the space, which might inspire some programming changes or some changes in something. Mm. You know, that's that's what we're here for, right? Change in the field. Sure. Right. I stand by my statement. Okay. Okay. Well, like, like I said, <laughs> send Scott all of the uh, emails because he told y'all to be quiet in the concert mm. hall. And I told you to come as you are. I said it is going to be <laughs> a cold shush war. All a right. shush cold war. Let's go ahead and get into this second movement to uh, transition us out of this. I thought of a piece by the composer Paul Hindemith. So he you know, famously wrote music for just about all the instruments. They say he could play all of the pieces that he wrote. And I can sort of believe it because his bassoon music isn't the most virtuosic of of his canon. You know, he was a viola player. So oh. all of that music is incredible. But once upon a time, he wrote a, a concerto uh, for bassoon and trumpet. And it was originally, I believe, in two, if I'm, I've performed it, I'm, I'm thinking it's in three movements. I'm remembering that it was originally in two movements. And the publishers or somebody was like, well, you really need a third movement on this. You know, is there no more music? So he quickly wrote a little 90 second third movement, but urged audiences to clap after that second movement if they appreciated it, you know, just huh. to make the point that this is really the conclusion. But this motherfucker over here told me that it needs to be th three movements. So here go a third movement. So anyway, mm. we'll transition out of this first movement into the second movement with the opening of this 90 second <laughs> third movement that Hindemith uh, came up with that he wanted to be uh, preceded by some applause. So here's a little bit of this to get us into the second movement of this week's opus. And that's how the piece ends. The, is the second movement has this big, grandiose conclusion. Mm. And then that final movement that he attacked on has that little, you know, sarcastic, little quiet thing. And I think, that's, I think that's another aspect of it. People are so excited by grandiose endings that they jump up to applaud. It happens almost every time. I think it's Chai Six, uh, Tchaikovsky's final symphony. That third movement is the big march celebratory movement, and people cheer and applaud after that when you have that final slow movement still to go. So, you know, there's there are all sorts of conversations that that can be had around the whole clapping, but I don't know. I I, I don't I just don't like <laughs> the idea of your saying that people just need to leave if they don't like it instead of reacting in the moment or offering some communication from ru the hall to the stage. If they're ruining it for me, mm -hmm. then yes, they should leave. You sound just like these uh, rich people who have always been in the hall. Yeah, I mean, do you not understand that's exactly what they're saying? Right. If these black people don't appreciate Beethoven, no, 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 I didn't get say your black asses color. out of here. No, I did not say that anything <laughs> about any colors. But you don't have to. You said if you don't like it, leave. What, where else would you do that if you if you're sitting in a movie theater and you don't like the movie you get up and leave you don't sit there and go and ruin it for everybody else but movies haven't spent 200 years pretending like people of color don't fucking exist that's the difference i don't care what color the person booing is if they feel like they need to do, sit there and persist, I would say the same thing about a person who does this through every minute of a concert. <laughs> what if they never quit clapping like we love everything you're doing? Everything you're doing, we love. I would That would irritate me too. Because at some point we do have to, I do want to hear some music. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I get it. I get it. I think we're just going to be on opposite sides of that of this conversation. Oh, I think we're closer together than you would want to admit. <laughs> oh, yeah. I do. Oh, yeah. I can't wait to go see a concert, especially some of the canon, and somebody is clapping through the whole thing. Someone is booing. I can't wait for there to be a little spice <laughs> in the concert hall, something for me to actually be entertained by at the end of the day. Come on, I, at some point, you want to hear some music. You're, I mean, you're there, to con you're there to hear some music anyway. Yeah. So that's yeah. all I'm saying. Okay. All right. Well, we're here in the second movement where y'all 
are going to hear some music, at least a little bit of some music. Scott and I are going to share a couple of pieces that we have been spending some time with this week. Let me see. Who do, who do we say is going first? Oh, I'm going first this week. All right. So in the intro, I played that uh, piano arrangement of Empire State of Mind. You know, mm-hmm. we were talking about pieces of music having that local impact. Well, last week as I was flying into New York, you know, I, I like taking those late night flights into the city because it makes my getting a cab or whatever from the airport a little bit easier than if I'm there at noon, you know, at the at the airport. So, you know, as I'm landing, I'm just thinking about, OK, let me get into this state of mind. You know, it's going to be crowded. I'm going to hear a lot of horns honking for the next, you know, 36, 48 hours. Just get me into the mode and New York. Just don't just be too rough on me this mm. trip. So as I'm thinking about that, you know, even doing a little bit of chanting on the plane, a track uh, that features Alicia Keys came to mind. It's called City of Gods. It's uh, a hip hop tune that was originally produced by Kanye. Um, but as is the case with a lot of hip hop tunes with strong, um, what do you call it, strong hooks, you know, especially if it's a, a, a woman singing it, that is expanded upon in a, some sort of remix. Maybe you remember, and maybe you don't, but uh, Eminem and Rihanna collaborated years ago on a tune called Love the Way You Lie. Yeah. Um, and so there was a part two of that that featured more of Rihanna than Eminem. Anyway, oh, okay. so that that's the same case for this tune called City of God. So part two features Alicia Keys. And the opening statement just so beautifully reflects what my sentiments were on that airplane. New York City, please go easy on me. And I've been listening to it over and over again ever since my trip last weekend. It's a tune that I think everyone should know something about. Really great performance here by Alicia Keys and City of Gods, part two. It's like when you find yourself in those situations where no matter what, you have to proceed forward and you have to proceed forward with a with the attitude of I'm going to proceed forward no matter what. So it's like, OK, if this is the path I got to take, at least, you know, don't give me your worst. Don't make it so hard for me. New York City, please go easy on me. And I have to say the city don't tend to go easy on you. (laughs) It's certainly not me as an outsider, you know, paying for lifts and being on the train for this long. And, you know, ain't no, but folks ain't got their mask on carrying on, you Mm -hmm. know, but, you know, even with all of, of that, even all with all of that proverbial mud, I'll say there are so many lotuses, you know, the people that you get to engage with, the, the delicious food you get to eat, you know, the, the running into people, the, um, just the, the things that people love about that place are there. You just got to get through that roughness. So, you know, all of those emotions are, are tied up in that track for me. And, uh, it's it's why I've been listening to City of Gods Part Two for the past several days on repeat. I really love it, and and not to mention that Alicia Keys is one of you know our great artists and a and a New York City local. I have never visited New York, and you're not really selling it right now. Mm-hmm. All that great, so you know, just like you said in the concert hall, if you if you don't like it, I guess you just need to leave then, huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Unless, of course, you're just going to walk around all day going boo, boo, <laughs> which some people Terrible do. Terrible boo. Some, some people all do. You know, you see all of it there. But <laughs> boo, New York. <laughs> anyway, right. City of Gods Part Two featuring Alicia Keys. Hope y'all go check that out. What you got this week for a for a second movement? I wanted to bring in the uh, current artist in residence with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. He's a cellist and vocalist. His name is. Abel Sela Okoye, and uh, there is a, a new release that I got a, a link, uh, a web link of uh, Yo Yo Ma and Abel playing uh, Africa is Back, sort of a lullaby treatment. Mm-hmm. And 
You know how last time we were talking about my trip back home and how I kind of mentally felt like a suitcase just opened and scattered around. And this wasn't one of those salve, rubbing salve on the wound sort of pieces of music. This made me feel more like a bringing everything back in to order, mm-hmm. a, a collecting or a gathering of it. And um, if you go to uh, the uh, warnerclassics.com, the, his management's website, he talks about this release. Uh, the title of the album holds um, multi, uh, Where is Home is the title of it. It holds multifaceted significance. Home is a place that empowers you. It's not only a geographical place, but in people as well, where you can live a life of empowerment and not of oppression. Mm. And the way that he brings his voice in, the way that Yo-Yo Ma plays, um, you can tell it's composed, but there's still that spontaneity sort of improvisatory vibe to it that they're, um, uh, like the gentleman in Toronto was talking about, they're looking at each other, communicating mm-hmm. with each other, and you feel those connections coming through in the music. And it just collects you up, it gathers you up, and helps you, like you say, uh, get your mind on w- what your focus should be. There is a lot of maturity that I have to bring to the table when I listen to that. And maybe that's not the conversation because it's undeniable that there is something very spiritual about exactly. this music and, and something that really pulls at those heartstrings. I have to center that instead of thinking about certain things, thinking about the question, does Yo-Yo Ma's presence in this piece of music, is that an attempt to legitimize it? Mm -hmm. Would it be getting the attention that it would get, that it's getting if he weren't there? We can talk about the meeting of cultures and and the bridging of experiences, but at the end of the day, we're all sitting here, everyone is sitting there with a Western European instrument reading sheet music. There's not much improvising or anything going on that I can see. Maybe, maybe there is. There are all those those little, you know, straws that I can pull on. And it's really an incredible performance. It's something that I would love to experience live, something that uh, I would love to experience on the radio or, or, you know, through my own recording collection. And, you know, something that I, I suppose that I would not boo if mm. I was in the, <laughs> in the concert hall. Maybe I would even sit there quietly and listen to it until they're done. But what if I want to sing along? What if I agree that Africa is back? What if I want to sing Ibu Yile L'Africa? Am I not allowed to do that? Are you, you you're telling the black man to shut up and, and let them sing about Africa? Never mentioned any colors, <laughs> by the way. Never mentioned any black men's, none of that. If you want to sing along, that's great. But if you're gonna if you're gonna heckle during that music, right? Because we talk I'm about we talk about we talk about things that are gonna get us back into the concert hall. Yeah. This has a shot oh, with yeah. me. Oh yeah, me too. And if you are going to interrupt that for me, I will remove you yeah. from that hall. Okay. Okay. So what else about this recording? I mean, how did you come There's on a, to it? How, uh, how? Like, a, like I said, I got an email about the release. Oh, right. So that's only just like three days ago. And we were just getting ready to go up north. I had just come back. You know, I had only had a few days off the road and I felt dislocated. Just mm-hmm. everything, nothing was really coming together just right. And there was something about the swells 
in that. The, there, was, there was a quiet power mm -hmm. about those swells that it wasn't the rocky theme music getting me ready to go again, but it was more go it was more that sort of parental or hmm. older brother or sister going, okay, now it's time for us to get back together. Yeah. We have to, we have to get everything going again so that we can continue our work. Yeah. So let's take this peaceful moment and, 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 and uh, give ourselves some energy for, for the next step. Sure. That's what sure. I heard. All right. Yeah. Let, let's take a listen to a bit of the, the ending of this, see how they wrap all this up. Isn't that beautiful? That is so beautiful. Abel, Sela, Okoye, and Yo-Yo Ma in that performance of Ibuyile L'Africa, or Africa is back. Really, really incredible, incredible music there. Nick Cooper, Karega Ani, and Michelle Thibault, they are all collaborators on an album called White Power Outage Volume 2. So for folks who have been with us for a while, uh, we uh, talked with uh, Nick Cooper a while ago when uh, White Power Outage Volume 1 came out. It's basically an album that musically expresses diversity and fighting against white supremacist structures all the way down to the way that we put music together. So, you know, so many artists have been involved with this. I produced one of the tracks that uh, I'll, I'll get into the, the interview with. But again, Again, this conversation um, is one among myself, Nick Cooper, Correga, Ani, and Michelle Thibault. We talk about race, we talk about music, and we talk about the formation of this album. I'll have a link uh, for the SoundCloud um, streaming in the description of this. I encourage everyone to purchase, offer what you can to this project, and listen to as much of it as you can. I think it's a really incredible body of work that covers all sorts of styles and aesthetics and perspectives. The track that I produced um, on here is called The Border Crossed Me. Not only am I playing bassoon and flute um, on, on this track, I transcribed a lot of what you hear the string players playing, you know, with the help of Nick, uh, we got some really great percussion on there. And I think it's a, a really great example of how we can use these Western classical instruments all the way to the activist front and, and making music that speaks to cultures that have virtually never been centered in concert spaces. So uh, I'm going to jump into this interview with Nick talking about the importance of acoustic instruments, so-called classical instruments, um, on this project. And we just go on from there. So here's a little bit of The Border Crossed Me as produced by yours truly to get us all into my conversation with Nick Cooper, Karega Ani, and Michelle Thibault, all contributors to the album White Power Outage Volume 2. Hope y'all enjoy. <laughs> We really look at it in terms of, you know, what can we do? Who do we know people that could do something? What would be a cool way to do this? You know, we're always just thinking about what do we have available, obviously, on a, a very limited budget. And, you know, how can we make this happen? And uh, so it wasn't so much as like we need to have a classical piece, but it would be like, oh, man, it'd be so cool if we could have something that has like a chamber feel. And this song kind of lends itself to it. And, um, you know, on other albums, we've had classical elements come in in terms of string arrangements on a funk tune or, or something like that. But this time we went kind of in the other direction and just let the classical musicians actually establish the whole groove and and, and do all of it. So, yeah, I mean, we uh, we, we just try stuff. You know, we we once we got into a a, um, a church organ room that they have uh, set up um, at U of H and I just like 
University of Houston, I, I think it was. And I just brought my drum set in there and like keyboard players playing on the church organ. I'm playing my drum set, you know, just get a crazy recording. Anything we can think of, we want to try to do it and experiment with different uh, sounds and people who are interested in collaborating, you know, instruments, uh, vocals, um, concepts, artwork, all of it. Yeah. And you and you mentioned budget. I do want to underscore the fact that I, I, I feel comfortable saying that much of this was low budget. That doesn't mean it's low quality. It just means there was a lot of collectiveness that was required to get this thing done. I had microphones set up here in my studio like I'd never had before and, and figuring stuff out. Nick, I wonder if you can uh, speak to that a little bit, the collectiveness that was required to get volume two of this project realized and, and out for people to download. Yeah, I mean, it's the money part of it. I mean, our albums generally lose a couple thousand dollars and that goes into the promotion. So for promoting it on Spotify, promoting it on into the press and promoting it to radio stations, we're basically spending several thousand dollars, most of which we don't get back. Um, the, the instrumental musicians are used to making OK money because we play a fair amount of weddings, funerals, private parties, corporate parties. We do stuff like that. And then the vocalist for both albums, we did different uh, fundraising strategies to be able to pay some uh, kind of honorarium. And uh, so we got a grant from um, Midtown Management District here in Houston for the second album. We did a GoFundMe on the first album. We did some benefit fundraising concerts, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of artists making much money off of recordings, no matter what they do nowadays. So you know, you you have opportunities to make money at live shows um although you know that can be a challenge too but uh, right right yeah so in a way like people are kind of like well i don't feel like i'm risking too much i want to be part of something but i i, I must say like there there is a fair i know a fair number of musicians who like didn't record with their group or record something you know that they could have at the time or whatever because everybody was worried about oh well how are we going to divide it up and they just never ended up doing it and they probably mm -hmm. weren't going to make any money anyway but it right. just you know never got released because people were all stressing out about it yeah and Karega, i want to jump to you you know we i definitely want to break down some of your contributions to this project but we talk about classical music a lot and reframing what that phrase even means. I, I tend to live on two camps. I, I definitely want to decolonize the phrase and make it mean something different in our American context and our uh, black and brown context. At the same time, I exist in the field and understand that most people just think of Mozart and, and those folks when they hear that phrase. What's your relationship with classical music as a genre and even as a as a concept well I, I like the way that you that you pose this question because that is accurate like when you're talking about classical um you're speaking of history kind of like you know classical as re, as it relates to what compared to what right so if you're talking about history then you have to determine whose history you're speaking about and then that helps you know which classical you're referring to um i think that there is there's absolutely a virtuous and redeeming quality to every person's and every culture's classical music. I think that African-American classical music, you could be speaking about ragtime. You could be speaking about jazz. You could be speaking about hip hop. Hip hop is 50 years old now. Mm -hmm. So I, I think at this point, you know, there's classical hip hop. Um, just like they say that there's classic rock. That's been, that's been a term that's been used my whole life. And yet, you know, no one ever refers to hip hop in terms of classic hip hop, but I think that it that the time is due for that. So, um, yeah, to your point, I think that is absolutely imperative that before speaking of classical music, one qualifies it. Nick, has has your perspective on on that idea of classical music shifted or evolved or been impacted by the inclusion of this instrumental work on this album? Well, I think as you know, musicians, we try not to worry too much about you know the labels. I mean, all the way back to uh, Duke Ellington, if you, you read his works on terminology and stuff, he's kind of makes fun of it and plays with it, and you know, so even within the band, if we're like, all right, like you know, and now now do it like kind of klezmer style, you know, we're not really saying like it has to sound like an actual klezmer tune. That might mean just throw in the klez some klezmer sounding you know mode on there or. It might it might mean anything, you know, mm -hmm. and we, we use the terms kind of loosely. And I think but at the same time, I also recognize that um, 
there are different timelines going on. So I remember this, this is something I was thinking of when they, they were, I heard somebody justifying abuses of corporal punishment of native American children that was going on in the Catholic church in the San Francisco area. And they were saying, but corporal punishment was the norm at the time or whatever. And it was like, it was the norm in Europe. That wasn't the norm in native American community. So you're, you're, you're using this different timeline, you know, it, you, you're, you, maybe you have this period that was your classical and now maybe you're coming out of it and thinking about human rights for the first time or whatever. That doesn't mean other people weren't already thinking about human rights for a long time. So mm-hmm. yeah, when you have this clash of timelines, you know, then it can create uh, confusion and, um, but it also, as artists, it also creates, creates lots of opportunities to play with stuff. So. Yep, these different timelines, these different cultures. I think that's a perfect segue, Correga, into talking a little bit about Crystal Stair. I, I have to say, it's definitely my favorite track on the album, and I produced one of the tracks. So, you know, I, I think I'm, <laughs> it's okay for me to, for me to <laughs> say that. Um, we can talk about, you know, the hip hop influence, the R&B influence, but the general aesthetic of this track, I think, is is so unique. How, how do you contextualize the aesthetic of of Crystal Stair, spoken word on top of all of this black classical music? Um, sure. I, You know, honestly, um, when I came in and I recorded Crystal Stair, um, the finished the finished product was not exactly what I recorded over there were there were like there was a framework for it, but there was a funk to it that lent itself very well to that particular poem. Um, if I remember it correctly, the way that that, that, that session went, um, Nick asked me to come in, he asked me to do a poem and he had a piece of music and I was like, okay, I have a, I have um, a book that I'm working on right now. Let me see if something from that book is going to work well with what it is that he's, he's already advanced me ahead of this session. So I just I thought about it, thought about it. I played with a few few concepts and then Crystal Stair was the one that fit. And then after after, you know, I came in and did the recording session, um, man, after they they did they did their kind of bells and whistles after, on it after that. And it felt very collaborative, which reminds me of another form of black classical music, jazz. Right. Which, you know, a lot of times people come together, they do jam sessions, those jam sessions turn into some of the canon you know, that we know of and love today. And so it felt very jazz like in the way that it came about. Um, but yeah, I mean, the soul, the funk was already there. I just, I lent my voice to it and it all came together in, in the form of what we know as Crystal Stair today. Michelle, I'm going to uh, jump to you in, in just a second. I have, I have one more question uh, for, for Correga and then we'll, we'll continue on. So Correga, one of the lines in the track that I've been thinking about a lot, you talked about uh, black folks as the variable unaddressed or spoken of instead of spoken to. You're drawing all of these comparisons and, and contextualizing culture, our culture, in, in an interesting way. The question that came to my mind was, does this mean that white supremacy defines what falls outside of whiteness? Is our culture, is our history ultimately defined by that if we're always uh, approximating it to the oppression and and to the 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 bad things that white supremacy has manifested on us i think that ultimately we'll really be doing something as a culture when we start to define ourselves and start to define ourselves in opposition to the what so it's like you ever heard that song uh got to keep it real compared to what Mm -hmm. yep all right it's like all right well what's the what if we determine that we are we're who we are compared to where we have been and where we want to go, then I think it's saying something different than we're, we're who we are as compared to the oppressor or compared to the persons who determine the normative standard and what that is and whether or not we see that as being something to aspire to. I don't look at our culture as a response to Eurocentrism. I see our culture as something that is separate and apart from Eurocentrism, that Eurocentrism has been placed on, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of been placed against, it's, it's placed itself in opposition to who we are, but who we were before them and who we are independent of them is something completely different than who we are in juxtaposition to them. So what I was saying in the poem, and please excuse me, I'm on the go. <laughs> what I was saying in the poem is essentially that, like we are who we are independent of what they say. A flower is beautiful, independent of whether or not you think it is. It just is. So we are factually 
a culture in and of ourselves, independent of whether or not we are a response to them. Make sense? Yep. Ooh. Michelle, what what do you think? I mean, how, how do you uh, approach the idea of culture, black and brown culture, separate from the impact of whiteness on that very culture? One thing that I've learned and just in being an African-American woman and in music is the, is the, is the connection. There is, there are things that we just connect to and we don't even realize if we don't know, if we don't do the research genetic, you know, they call it genetic DNA, Mm -hmm. that memory, that memory. I work at a school and there are kids. I'll never forget it. There were kids who were outside playing in the sunshine and they started dancing. The way in which that they were jumping up and down was so clearly Maasai. The other kids who were, were, um, it's like they were, some of them were not only jumping straight up and down, but some were squatting and coming up and squatting and coming up. And that whole, they didn't even realize the connection. And it hit me like, these are young kings that have princes that have no idea that they're actually really connected in so many more ways than one. They don't even know why they're they're jumping like that, moving like that. They have no idea. So for me, it's all about the connection. This this a connection that is um, is genetic, and we've forgotten. Um, unfortunately, we're coming back. You could you could see the the consciousness is we're starting to reawaken um and uh, and some of us have already been on that journey and so uh i i will say that for those who have already been doing the research and are now really open be patient with those who are just learning about this connection so that's what i think um it's really about that 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 uh, that real beautiful uh you know genetic you know, connection that, uh, yeah, that's what I think. That word connection is, is really good because when I think about, uh, the tune over that, you know, is just such a a masterful, you know, (laughs) composition. I think about, you know, the first time I listened to it, I was thinking about the many different black aesthetics that live in it, the blues, you know, Mm -hmm. a a little bit of gospel that I can pick out of there. Toward the end, we're getting into into that reggae backbeat. I wonder if all of these are aesthetics that, you know, are foundational to your musical experience, or if there are certain black aesthetics that you've had to spend more time exploring exploring or or learning about. What's been your relationship with the, the diversity and connecting all of those things? Well, first, I have to say it's all the above. I surround myself with those, which I highly recommend. It's scary. Surround yourself with those who know more than you. Hmm. There are things that I naturally am attracted to. My parents raised uh, raised my brother and I to uh, explore. And they gave us deep roots in gospel and deep roots in Zodico deep roots in R&B, deep roots in soul, sneaking into my brother's room, deep roots into, into, into jazz and hip hop, right? Then as I got older, meeting other people, uh, and, and by the way, having a cousin um, who, he was the first, first person I ever saw with these long, 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 long locks, came from a family where all of his brothers were doctors, except for him. He wanted to, he just had a different calling. So he played and he plays reggae music, right? So um, it was really, it's really about surrounding yourself with people who know more than you. And what I also have to share is that (laughs) I wanted to create a song. This is very, it's, it, it may sound strange, but the imagery, if you can imagine, uh, is this very, sultry young lady who clearly has is very definitive in her thoughts and in her stance and she just wants to just slyly let you know it's over Mm. there was an article years ago uh, or a comment actually in an article that um made 
and he talked and it, it got it, it garnered a lot of, of controversy but he spoke about how black women use their sexuality in during the times of slavery that they used that as a form of empowerment. And of course, everyone had opinion, an opinion about it, but what that sparked in me was there's a, the truth was we were forced in many ways, and that was one of them. Hmm. But in order for us to take our power, we had to not use that, but to protect ourselves, we had to, um, I don't want to say use it because that's that's not the connotation. I believe that he was, he was, um, that I don't believe that that was his message or his point, but I do believe that because we had to survive, uh, that was one of the ways that we uh, acknowledged and had to move through it, but we moved through it with power. Mm. And so that was the, the vibe, you know, behind the song. I wanted to present all of that <laughs> in the tone, in the approach, in the cadence. Um, I hope it came across um sassy and just but a quiet uh sass you know and still uh for the people like i just wanted to let you know you know you mm -hmm. may think that i am very oh oh but in actuality <laughs> you know that's a, uh, a quiet sass that sounds like the yes. title of another project <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm open. <laughs> Nick, I want to stick to that idea of connectivity. There are so many iterations and um, reverberations, manifestations of the center pin that is, you know, white supremacist culture. How do you uh, engage connecting all of these different things and putting it into one project toward what we have in common. It's so easy, you know, even on uh, on the BIPOC side of things for us to be splintered and to be separated based on the way that white supremacy has impacted our communities uniquely. How do you engage in, uh, in centering the connectivity and what we do have in common? Um, well, I guess, you know, as a white looking producer, I, you know, I feel like, you know, it's, like Michelle said, it's over. It's so easy to let go of uh, defensiveness and, and uh, resistance to a, a message of resistance or a message of unhappiness, disgust, anger. Like, why not just let all of that go and just be like, yeah, just uh, say as say it as, as much as you want, as hard as you want. Like, just just get it out there and like, OK, like. There, there might be some point in which I'm saying, OK, like this has gone so far that I'm uncomfortable with it. If you were calling for like genocide or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that that point doesn't ever hardly get reached. You know, it's just like and and to uh, celebrate in each other's, uh, uh, you know, just encourage people to just do it, like push it further, do more like, you know, whether it's uh, musically or thematically or something like that, you know. And and uh, so I'm, I'm surprised that. uh you know, to see uh, so much uh, defensiveness, you know, because in a way, like, isn't it easier just to say, like, I want to hear it, I want to, I want to experience it, I don't know. So I've definitely tried to, you know, make sure that that's consistent. And just to let people know, like, yeah, just just bring it musically, you know, you have an idea, you, you're playing this instrument on this tune, but you have an idea about something totally unconnected, you have an idea for the video, or you have an idea of what a violin could come in and play it, just like, yeah, just do it. Write it down. Let's, you know, sing it into your phone and send it to me. Let's let's make it happen, whatever the idea is. And and like, you know, as a producer, too, like, you know, yeah, it's just like if, if people are hitting you with ideas, if you can use all of them, it's so much easier than having to come up with them yourself. So if you have enough people around with around all the time, it's just like bring it on, you know, whatever, whatever you can add. And and uh, and I mean, I, I know that I, I appreciate everybody's messages of hope, but I also want to say that that to sometimes a project like this feels to me like we, we went into a burned up kitchen pantry and, and took all the stuff that was left and, and we managed to make an edible really yummy mm. dish out of it but just imagine what that dish would have been if it hadn't been burned down in the first place just imagine what it would be like collaborating with between countries if there hadn't been a history of war and an ongoing war and, and depression just imagine you know i mean just Russia and Ukraine, just imagine if we we're all like, you know, on the same side, you yep. know, like all of this, 
this insane thirst for war and weapons and, and destruction and oppression. Like, you know, it, it, yeah, we're still doing a great job of making what we can from the ashes, but what a tragedy it is, what we could have had, like, you know, if we had a, each approached each other collaboratively instead of, you know, destructively. Yeah. Yeah. Karega, what do you think? I believe completely in solidarity, but behind this movement, I also have lived the reality where, progressive movements continue to marginalize black people and blackness specifically what's 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 the balance there in your view i think the balance is to be realistic with how you approach a movement um not everybody is going to be able to be under your tent and that's okay because there can be more than one tent um you find those people who who are Re who resonate with your message. You find those people who you can resonate with theirs. You find those commonalities and you build from there. Um, anything else, I think you're already shooting yourself in the foot because you're being kind of Pollyanna-ish about how you're going to affect change. Um, the fact of the matter is we have all been, um, we've all been subject to oppression and what that does to one's psyche, what that does to one's sociology. Um, and so knowing that you're already kind of hamstrung by that before you walk into a battle means that you know how to be pragmatic about how you walk into that battle. And then you move appropriately. You build from where you are, not from where you think you ought to be. So I think that it's important that when building collaborative efforts, when building coalitions, um, one look at where they can find common ground and then build from that. Um, provided that those places where they don't find commonality are somehow disqualifying or somehow, um, you know, break, break apart the parts that can be useful. Mm. So if, if you don't if you don't have spaces that rather if you don't have um, things that you don't have in common that can be disqualifying, then, hey, roll with it. Don't be so idealistic to think that you're going to agree on everything. I think that really the oppressor has done a great job of finding those places where they can where they can collaborate and then they work with that. They may hate each other's guts and they still work with that. Um, oftentimes we'll be like, well, if I can, if you can't agree with everything that I say, then I can't work with you at all. And I think that's self-defeating. Mm. Michelle, I want to get your thoughts. And what I'll add into that is uh, the variable of gender. A black man's experience is very different than a black woman's experience, which is very different than a, a black trans woman's experience or a black trans woman living with a disability. We can we can add all sorts of things. What, what, are, what are your thoughts there again on this idea of connectivity, uh, unity, solidarity in light mm -hmm. of the many things we don't have in common? You know, I think that one, we all, um, of course, I agree with uh, my brothers. Craig, I love you and so good to see you. I haven't seen him in so long. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so um, yes, and, um, and thank you for this opportunity. Nick, I can't even tell you. And sir, thank you for your Thank you. Thank questions. You. Your questions are amazing. Oh, the pleasure's um, all mine. <laughs> it's, 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 you have a gift. Um, what I wanted to say or, or add was from a female perspective, we are on the, or I am a nurturer, uh, you know, by nature. <laughs> and in reg the only way, because I'm also a music teacher, but how do I connect? How do I connect with all these kids that I see? Kindergarten through fifth grade, two classes. So how many kids is that? It's a lot, you know, in a week, right? But how do and I, I and I have what's called Hip Hop Fridays because hip hop is so important. I believe that the kids uh, and what they're listening to these days. They need to understand. My only point is that find a balance. Find a balance. If you're going to listen to the hip hop or rap that you listen to, I want you to understand the pillars of hip hop, right? And the, and, and the principles of hip hop and compare it to what you're listening to. Is it feeding you? Because hip hop, for me, did all these things and I have a list. But my whole point in presenting this was how do I connect with these you know with these children mm -hmm. how 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 is it that i you know that it's it's believable everything that i'm saying right all i know is 
the work that I've been doing, they call it shadow work, right? The work that, um, the way in which I um, stay in tune, it's a constant work and it's always on a different level. Sometimes it's really beautiful. And then sometimes it's, I feel lost, you know, where I'm just like, okay, I need to get outside. Sometimes, you know, I've been working too much or whatever. But the bottom line is, in order for us to affect change on the at the deepest level in regards to what our work is, my my the 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 way in which I affect change is, is going to be different than anyone else's. And you know, we all have a, uni a unique way. That connection comes from connecting. I need to connect with myself first, in order to know oneself, in order to know self, in order in order to in, and in order to connect, I have to know myself deeper and deeper. And it's a constant walk it's a constant work and um that is the only way because people are going to connect if you're believable people are going to connect if it's authentic mm -hmm. but you can't be authentic if you don't know yourself so and it and, and that that journey comes in all different ways either being well read work like constantly reading things if that's your thing or constantly contact uh, just being in contact with people and having conversations about it and just so many different ways. But you know, the main thing is connecting with yourself as deeply and as consistently as you can. And from there, you know the work that you got to do. Some people connect. Uh, it, it, it's, it's all in your purpose. Once you connect with yourself, you understand what you overstand, what your purpose is. There are people who are meant to teach there are people in, in teach in different ways, whether it be accounting, mm -hmm. whether it be a podcast. There are so many people who have podcasts that you turn it on, you listen, you're like, nope, you just don't <laughs> connect with it. But, yep. if, but, you know, the mere fact that you're asking questions in this way is obvious that you have a connection and you know what your work is. So therefore, you're going to affect change. Or Nick, the, the way in which he connects with all kinds of people and for years, you know, uh, and Carrega, the way in which his poetry is so rich, his production, you know, that, that to me, it, it speaks to people who are open. And I just think that we're all connecting in our own way because we're doing the work of self connecting, you know, that's it's it. really it's really interesting, Michelle. You know, you're a, a self-described nurturer. You're a music teacher. Did it just so happen that the other track that you're involved with on this project involved the voices of children? Was that just happenstance, or was that by design? That's that wonderful Nick over there who <laughs> <laughs> who wrote. He actually wrote the song. And the interesting thing is, I am a songwriter. I do though enjoy singing. Um, other people's works, you know, that I connect with. And so when he asked me to do it, because it's Nick, you're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that's really his vision. And I really, I'm just honored that oh, he asked. Thank me. you. Well, well yeah, and, and Nick talked talk a little bit about bipartisan baby jail. I mean, I definitely had a visceral reaction to hearing children singing those words. The first time I went through that track, I, I couldn't help but to, to really feel what, what, what was the development of that track like? Yeah, I mean, it was this moment of like, when Trump was still in office, all the energy for the Democrats are like, okay, we got to end these things. And then the Democrats come in and they don't end those things. And nobody seems to notice. And I'm sitting there like, wait a second, like, that was the whole thing. And they're like, well, you know, don't complain about it. At least Biden's doing some other thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? This was, you got me all excited about this thing that was going to happen, you know? And, uh, and, and so... It was that and, and hearing Kamala's uh, words when she visited the border, do not come, do not come. You know, I was just like, what is this? You know, and, and it just brought up Statue of Liberty to mind. You know, I was just like, man, like I remember the, the you know, I, I'm from New York City. I remember the words <laughs> at the base of the Statue of Liberty. So I was like, what if we stuck them in a song, you know, and, and did something with it? So we I got the little Statue of Liberty hats that we put on uh, for the video um and and stuff to play around with but yeah and it was like um one of those things too where it's just like put out different ideas and then like i'm like oh, i could write something for this and you know could you sing this and 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 i mean michelle refers to like 
I asked her to do it and she said, yes. Well, there've been a lot of situations when I've asked somebody to do something and they said no. And that's important too, because they don't want to do that. And that's, that's cool. Like I'm not, not mad at them, you know, I'm just like trying to figure out ways to connect stuff and I don't expect them all to work. Um, and the other big collaborative tune on their checkpoint, you know, we have English, Arabic and um, Afrikaans, you know, uh, rappers in, uh, from Gaza, uh, from South Africa, from the U.S. and then Lindy Yeni, this elder um, who had lived in Houston, had lived in South Africa most of her life, lived in Houston, performed for Nelson Mandela, started the Kumba House dance. Like I was like, man, I got to get Lindy on there. And I, and I was just <laughs> like, Lindy, record like a little skit with an apartheid era checkpoint on your phone and I'll, I'll throw it in there. And she's like, sure, you know? And I was just like, man, I, I just felt so blessed to like, you know, because because there's so many people like that that, you know, they, they wouldn't think of everything that you might think of but like you know just throw ideas to them and see if they say you know if they're into it or, or if they're not into it okay how could i change it a little bit so that it would work and when they come together it's just uh, uh i don't know i'm i'm so proud of it and i'll tell you you know it might not seem that weird that there's a song in three different languages but i know it's a really weird thing because there is no way to even enter that information mm -hmm. on youtube on CD Baby, on a music distributor, on Spotify, you got to pick one language and that's it. And they're not set up for multilingual songs. So I guess there's not a lot of them, but we, we have a couple of them uh, uh, on the albums, several of them. Yep. And I'm still thinking about the, again, the voices of those children. Michelle, let me, let me come back to you. When it comes to activating the youth or teaching them what the work is that's ahead of us, where I will use words like teaching or education, you have people who would use other words like indoctrination. How do you approach engaging conversations like these with eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds? Is it too early for them? And if it's not too early, how, how, do, how do we do it? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. People, you know, as I as I said, I surround myself with some amazing people who are much more well read than I, you know, and uh, so they use their verbiage, right? But for me, what I've learned when you want to connect, because that is the most important thing for me, um, is being myself. And so what I say, just like when my husband and I are, are, you know, when we are, our boys are now, can't believe it, 18 and 22. And we told them when they were younger, no matter, and Correga knows, no matter what, there's going to be a moment when <laughs> we're not going to be with you out in this world. And what are you going to have? You have your, you call it Holy Spirit. You call it that instinct. So as I'm talking to the kids, how funny is this? I have to introduce, if I'm the music teacher, then I have to put it in their lane. And I have, to, I have to start from the beginning. What mm. is sound? Mm. Mm. Sound is a vibration. Do you, and then I can add in, do you believe that there are good vibrations or bad vibrations hmm. connecting it to even literally how um how vibrations enter the literally i'm talking about that now right how uh, a sound the vibration the sound wave will enter your ear send the message to the brain to let you know that hey you're listening to a piano whatever right so i kind of play with that vibration part and when i tell you last year we had third fourth and fifth graders I, I was in the middle of talking about it. And then all of a sudden they're like, Miss Lyons, I don't think that some of the songs I listen to are good for me. Hmm. So from there, when they, when they, and even if, of course, even if all of them don't understand that part of it, at least some of them do, and I can still move it through to what you have is your instinct and your Holy Spirit that guides you. It is, it spans it crosses religion and spirit. When you walk into a situation and you're engaging, when you're a, a young person and you're engaging in business and they say something that doesn't feel right, you're right. Hmm. If you're reading, if you're a kid and you're reading a history book and you're like, you're reading this information and the teacher's just teaching it and you're like, something isn't 
Right. You're right. So for B, in order to kind of spark that, um, uh, that listening to that inner, inner, that's what I start with because I feel like that, when something doesn't feel right, you're right. Miss Lyons, is that all there is? Is, is Dr. King and, um, uh, and Harriet Tubman? You know what I mean? Like they, they know that there's, there's something more. So for me, when you gauge your life in that way, then you start to, you're that much more open to what's really going on in the world. You're going to ask, you're going to, you're going to be quicker to, 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 you know, to ask or say, I don't think I like that. Speak mm. up for yourself because something in your body doesn't feel right. Yeah. So that's how I approach it. That's how I'm trying to train these kids to move through their, their knowledge of self and, yeah. and knowledge of what's really going on in the world. And as an African-American male, um, as you're, as you're, you know, as you're engaging with people who, who don't look like you, you can feel anger. You can feel the dislike. You can feel when you're in the, in a certain like part of town that doesn't feel right. You don't feel safe. You don't feel safe. It's a feeling, you know? So that's what, that's how I started. <laughs> yep. So, so we're, as we begin to wrap up here, Karega, yes. I want to throw one more uh, question your way, sticking with this idea of self. We have this project and we have your brilliant uh, contribution to the project. How do you uh, contextualize your work moving forward? It's much more than just recording music. How do you, how, how, how do you see your broader work um, as, as we continue to fight this battle? Sure. Um, and thank you all for having me. Um, I think for me, I'm going to just continue in the, in the vein of what my predecessors and my teachers told me, which is art has a purpose, right? And especially when you have a people who have been perennially oppressed, um, you know, there is going to be at least a, at least a core, like a nugget, if not a straight up explicit pretense of revolution, of resistance in my work, um, that is going to be consistent throughout the time that I speak, throughout the time that I play, throughout the time that I contribute art in the world. And, you know, for me, I've always wanted to make the world a better place than what it was before I arrived here. Um, I recently wrote a poem in which I speak of myself as a lighthouse. I came across a picture in which it, um, and, and, and the byline for the picture said that this lighthouse here was built of the same stones that it wore ships against. And I thought that that was so, I thought that that was so spot on for what purpose-driven artists really are, especially those of us who have a little bit of time on earth and have had some experiences, some of which have been not so good. And we take those stumbling blocks and we turn them into building blocks. And for me, that's that's how I see myself. And as for my work, I see that as the light that exudes from this lighthouse that's been built from these mistakes, this trial and error, this life that I've lived. So I'm gonna continue in that vein, continue to take those, continue to take that information um, that I've been provided, even if it's retroactively looking back at my own life and saying, oh, wow, well, I didn't catch that lesson back in 1989, but I get it in 2023. Mm -hmm. And now <laughs> and now I apply it going forward for the rest of my days on the planet. So, you know, I hope that answers the question. In essence, um, where, where I see my work going from here on is I'm trying to free as many minds, try to free as many people as I possibly can through the it. contents of history rendered us unwilling to continue this facade. Your inability to generate original concepts renders genocide and suicide synonymous. So, who will you be when the polyrhythm stops and the karma comes a calling? As long as we've been acquainted, our patience has been your salvation. But if I were ever asked about it, I'd say my culture is awakening, reclaiming a translation of love still unmolested by the devil's tongue, embracing the overcoming implicit of relentless struggle when fighting is all there is left to do, and the only alternative is dying. My culture is coming out swinging and singing and smiling, reclaiming, renaming itself whole. My culture is my own, and I'm no longer open to your suggestions. Contrary to your narrative, there are some things that I don't need or want your help with. Besides, if history has revealed anything, it's that my culture dies. Whenever your opinion is considered. Mm, mm, mm. That's that's something. Crystal Stair featuring Karega Ani, uh, who joined me alongside Nick Cooper and Michelle Thibault in that conversation. Let's quickly unpack what was just said. In that track, 
Correga said, my culture dies where your opinion <laughs> is considered. I know that I have really been beating this horse of what we're supposed to do in the concert hall, but I feel like that's what he's speaking to. There is a culture based on tradition and the tradition of certain respectability politics and, and power dynamics that at the end of the day, this culture and this opinion will always take Trump over this culture or this opinion. And that's what I what I feel like he's he's speaking to there. The idea that we have to allow something else to take the back seat because there is a certain opinion, aesthetic perspective that has always taken the back seat if it's allowed in the car in the first place certainly when it comes to to western classical music i think he's hitting on something there and maybe it's not a direct translation as to what we're talking about with the concert hall but something i think can be considered at least for the sake of conversation and dialogue mm -hmm. i also heard the uh, nice little shout out to the amen break in the uh, oh, yeah. last part of the drum section there yeah that's culture i love the way he flows over just the samples and and the changing drum tracks this is a this is a great find yeah yeah one of many incredible tracks on white power outage volume two before we got into the uh, final movement i wanted to ask you scott you know so again like i said i was really stretching myself in being a part of this project not you know as far as values or spiritually but you know setting up microphones in a different way and recording instruments which i don't do a whole bunch bunch of, right. you know, in, in my work, but, you know, I really believed in this and, you know, I was asked what I could do. So I did absolutely everything I could. Do you find yourself stretching beyond your core skill sets when it comes to the way that you are, you know, pushing the conversation forward or, or working on transforming the field? What, what are the, what are the, uh, periphery peripheries of, you know, your skill set and, and what you do? Um, in you know, in, in change making work, talking into a microphone is something you've done for thirty years. What's stretching you these days, if anything? Well, you know, I complained a lot about that Pro Tools course, mm -hmm. so that was stretching me in a direction that, you know, just the the um, that side of the brain. I hadn't been doing much with you know learning something new with that software the way that I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it kicked in a lot of doors, for sure. But right now, what I'm trying to do is a lot of modeling behavior at work. And so I'm just trying to be a leader in that way. Yeah. Um, I don't have any power, but I can, I can model behavior. Yeah, yeah. And we have to talk more about empowerment and maybe even empowerment training. It's one thing to talk about equity training, but empowerment and autonomy, those are things that we all just have. No one can give those things to us. So I always think about it as finding opportunities to act on that autonomy and to act on that empowerment. You talk about modeling behavior. I think that's uh, an example of that. And we have to stretch beyond just what the job is or what the rules say or what we feel like we should do to inspire change. I'm certainly doing that. It sounds like you're doing that as well in your own unique way. Mm. I'm doing everything that I can at this point with what power that I do have, yeah. which is... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not much, <laughs> but, um, you know, like last week when I was talking about accomplishments, I count this podcast as part of it. Yeah. You know, the, this was something that we started together mm -hmm. and I can turn around and look at the accomplishments of that and, and have a sense of pride. And I try to take that with me in every situation that I'm in, Yeah, especially with family, dude, back home, trying to help them have a little, have some realizations. So what? So you're saying you get around the dinner table and say, "So I heard what you said on Triloquy last week, and um... you would be surprised." <laughs> yes. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into this uh, final movement. Uh, we were talking. You know, we one of the sub themes of this opus has been home and local engagement and local music and that sort of thing. And, you know, when thinking about a piece of music to get us into this final movement, at least an ensemble, you brought up uh, the high respects for, for folks who are not local. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can offer some uh, context on the high respects. What is, what is this ensemble? They are a Twin Cities hip hop band. They all went to Central High School together. Uh, Sean McPherson is uh, the bass player for the band and Devon Russell Gray uh, plays keyboards. I am not 
I have not been introduced to other members of the band, but yeah, uh, they when twentyish years ago they had a they had a solo that went out on uh, not a solo a single that was even on MTV. They yeah. had a video and all that. Yeah, um, and so they've you know had some pretty good local success. They toured for a while. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. One of their more popular tracks is called Fives, the number five V E S, and I think you know, a true sign of something being successful. They talk about imitation is the best form of flattery. So the sincerest wh- form of wh- flattery. When we start to see covers of, you know, originally created songs, especially on the local level, that's when I believe, you know, something has really happened. So I found a piano cover of Fives by High Respects. This is on the YouTube channel, Jamming on the Ivory. So shout out uh, to this pianist, shout out to High Respects. And uh, we'll listen to a little bit of this very local cover of a very local track as we move into the final movement of this week's Opus of Triloquy. to hear that on on classical radio and i think that would have huge local impact on a national show and it would give a national audience a little taste of what the twin cities sounds like saint paul specifically i like i don't know uh i'm I'm thinking a lot about uh you know this new ceo of the toronto symphony and really trying to point things more local i Mm -hmm. think there really is something to that there there's some magic, I think, behind going to a city that you've never been to and maybe catching an orchestra concert and through that concert, getting a taste of the city. Sure. You know, I, 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 I compare flying to San Diego and hearing their local symphony playing Beethoven 5. For me, that's like going to Senegal and staying at the Holiday Inn or, you know, going going to Dublin and having lunch at the Hard Rock Cafe. Like, why would I do that when I can get more of a local flair right. that I will I may never get again? That's what performing arts institutions have the opportunity to do for audiences, both local and visiting, tra- traveling through. And I've, if if we can only dig more into that, we could talk about transforming the field. I mean, that 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 article has um, ins- inspired me. Shout out again to all the folks up there at uh, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and their new CEO, Mr. Mark Williams. I, I hope we have a, a positive update, you know, in the in the weeks and, and months and, and seasons ahead. Me too. But we're here in the final movement. What I want to speak to is the concept of equity and why we're doing this work in the first place. I feel like we have gotten really used to talking about platforming music by people of color, marginalized genders and identities just as the right thing to do. But there are actual reasons behind, you know, these so-called right things to do. Are you able to, I don't know, just verbalize or offer context as to why you put your neck on the line as often as you do why you're you know in these stressful situations it's not for nothing it's not for your health it's not like you're getting paid extra to engage these things so why do you even bother in the first place this is something that i got into a conversation with uh, the general manager of wfmt george preston at the public radio program directors conference because you'll remember when you came in uh on the night that george floyd was killed and mm-hmm. and you had to relieve me that night and I was not in a good way. And that was only because a lot of things locked into place, mainly over the years, how in a lot of ways I propped up, uh, unwittingly propped up a lot of supremacists and, and, and racist ideas. Mm-hmm. And I felt like it was a responsibility for me to, 
in some small way, at least sponge away, you know, some of the things that I have done myself. Yeah. And if I can model, if I can just show people that it's possible for you to deal with it and begin to move past it. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I am right now. And, you know, above all of it is just, you know, trying to remind myself every day that I wake up, I'm in the default setting, you know, so I've got, a, I've got a chance at, at modeling and correcting behavior. Yeah. The way that I think about it and approach it is that, again, for hundreds of years, the field of classical music as we know it here in the West has basically pretended like there are a number of cultures, perspectives, ideas that just don't exist. Right. You know? Or they're inferior. Or or inferior or don't matter right. or, or many ways for us to look at it. So for me, equity is dealing with that. You know, I think the textbook definition of equity, you know, talks about equal outcomes. So what what can mm. we do mm. as the means to the end of equal outcomes? For me that looks like setting certain goals, you know, sometimes even percentages, you know, x percent of whatever mm -hmm. to, you know, be represented here. In my days at um APM NPR, my thing was there shouldn't be an hour of programming that goes by that doesn't include a person of color or someone from a marginalized gender or someone who is alive. And that was a part of the compromise that I was making because in, you know, uh, in a planet where the global majority are people of color and are women, you know, why should classical music be a space where, you know, an hour can go by and we don't hear from anyone from any of those communities. That just does, doesn't make actual sense to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's beyond just being an activist or doing the right things. It just makes sense. You know, living in this world, you have to engage the world. So how can an hour of programming go by when we're only focusing on dead white men from Europe, you know? But even beyond that, I think that we need to take some time to reconsider what lived experience means in these conversations and not just identity. In a lot of ways, for me, this comes down to what you're missing. Um, there is so much more than the canon that keeps getting repeated over and over and over. And I think you only benefit by being exposed to uh, composers that are not, that don't look like you. I think it's more enriching when you hear the perspectives of those that aren't yours. And I think that if, in order for all of this to sustain, just like they were talking about in that article that we covered about um, uh, shushing, mm -hmm. um, we've been having the conversation for a while. Even folks back in Mozart's time are going, you know, we're spending too much time on the on the people who are dead. Mm -hmm. So we have to we have to look at our uh, our living composers, and and they come from every corner of the planet. And I think that even goes beyond music specifically think about what you're missing out on if you never left the block you grew up on or the the city that you grew up in think about the conversations that you could engage that you have engaged in the off the beaten path pub in ireland or mm -hmm. you know if you were to go have dinner you know somewhere interesting in in new york city you know we can build these barriers around oh well you know going to this place or or being in this crowd is is a, a headache or something that i don't want to do x y and z and and that's fine you know to, for for people who experience different things but i think at the end of the day you're exactly right there are things that we're missing out on when we don't take the opportunity to go beyond the the walls that have been built around certain things, some of the walls we've built around ourselves, and just go explore those things. For me, equity is sort of um, forcing that or or pushing that along to a greater degree than uh, it has in in the past. You know, exposing people to perspectives and aesthetics and ideas that they haven't been exposed to or that haven't been centered in this art form toward the goal of all of us knowing more about this world, knowing more of what's out there and building something that in encourages more of us to participate, to buy a ticket 
to the concert hall to give a damn what's happening on the public radio station. We just have to broaden the scope of inclusion so that, you know, someone can actually see themselves and what's happening. I think we need to constantly, as we continue in this work as an industry, just return to that why. You know, if a, if a, if a, a concert hall, if, a, if an orchestra is scheduling William Grant Still, followed by Florence Price, followed by Chevalier de Saint-Georges, followed by Beethoven's Bridge Tower Sonata, followed by, you know, whatever else, uh, Porgy and Bess, followed by Scott Joplin's X, Y, and Z. You know, that is a, a, a perspective on you know, black music and composers who have been marginalized, but that's still not really speaking to today's experiences. It's so easy for us to fall into the bucket of doing something for the sake of identity, which I think is important because identity is connected to experience in many cases, but that's just not a, a cut and, and dry thing. You know, that the poor white Appalachian composer who is trying to make it, you know, should be offered a little bit of equity over Sasha Obama or in, insert famous black woman who, who writes a new piece of music. You know, not everyone is going to have that perspective because I think we're losing the point of equity. We're, we're, we're losing the why of it. And I just want people to take a second to think about that a little more as we continue to move forward. And especially as we continue to use that word, it's just that why is such an important part of it that we don't always, you know, really, really consider. I don't know. So as, as we, as we close, do you have any words for folks searching for their why? Maybe, you know, your why isn't something that you could just, you know, easily express or 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 put into a, a nutshell, but I believe that that why is there. How important for you is the why? Or how or how how do you rate the importance of understanding the why in doing this work? Or does it matter? No, I do no, I do think it matters. And you know that my why landed really hard and I had to find a way that I was going to deal with my complicity. Yeah. And going forward, what did what what moves could I make in order to? Um, th the thing is, is that I don't know if that goal is ever going to be attained. I don't know if I'm going to be able to wash enough to get it to go away. Mm -hmm. But I can't sit here and look at it stained like that either. Yeah, yeah. So that's my that that was my discovery. Yeah. And I think it's going to be different for everybody else because other people have different levels of privilege. Other people have not gone on as long as I have in a career before they had the realization or that one little peak of light. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's going to be different. I have a why. I have a vision. I have a path forward. I need all of us to have that why. So as you continue in this work, at least even thinking about the conversation of equity in the arts or anywhere it exists, please try to understand that why. I think focusing on the why gives you power, but it also gives you a streamlined approach. It gives you a conviction to stand in, and it gives you something to weigh all of your decisions and actions and dialogue against. That why is incredibly, incredibly important. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week. Why you have listened to us babble for so long, I don't know, but you know, and we appreciate it. See you next week.